the band, the Final Vision, just just came together. They haven't been rehearsing for years or months. It's just been short weeks that they've been brought together for this retreat and the song we just heard and Into the Mystic have just been given to us by the Spirit for our gatherings this weekend. It's beautiful. I see all your smiling faces. They're, they're flicking th through the screens of the many screens of faces because they're just all over the world. Everybody's tuning in and we're all going down into the mystic together. So oh, it's beautiful, beautiful to see your faces. And thanks, Jeff, for leading us in, lighting the incense. And Jeff's high, high up in the mountains of Peru, just leading us in. Not too far from Machu Picchu. <laughs> well, this journey is something that I would say for me and for most of us, it, when the calling starts to come in, this deep calling, it can be a bit startling and a bit surprising because I don't know about a lot of you, but I can just speak from my experience in the parable of David that, that I didn't really see this coming. Um, you start to feel it on the inside, but I didn't come from a lineage of saints or a lineage of mystics. Uh, if I even mentioned those words, uh, my biological family would look at me with a funny, twisted look on their face like, what are you on about? What are you even talking about? And so I didn't have a lot of uh, past reference for this deep dive into the mind, into the spiritual presence. I mean, like a lot of you, I'm sure I, I had a religious context that I was raised in, a cultural context, and there, the ego projected the whole thing out. And, and yet when we start to answer the call, we start to be taken. You might remember that, that uh, poem, The Road Less Traveled, you know, I uh, took the one less traveled by, talking about the road less traveled. And that has made all the difference. We are all being called on a journey that is so radical to the ego because it's an ego alien journey. The ego doesn't believe there is such a journey to God, doesn't believe in, in this presence and love and stillness. The ego is the, the defense against that divine love and stillness. So, so for us, that's we could say that what has all brought us together in this kind of quantum way on this online retreat is, is this presence of love that's guiding us and we're all being brought together in what seems like a situation called an online retreat, but it's actually just a reflection of our desire to wake up, to remember our true identity in heaven. And we're all here by readiness. And I was just giving this talk uh, not too long ago at the at the mystery school, the Tabula Rasa Mystery School at the monastery, and I understand our uh, our monastery group is joining us today. So now we have yeah our groups from Mexico and from the monastery and from all over that are you know the mystery school is blended in with the online retreat. It's all it's all based on readiness. We're all ready to be here. We're ready to hear what's going to be spoken. We're ready to let go of, of the concepts of the world and the pursuits of the world. Sometimes you get to a point with living out the programming and the conditioning where you just start to get fatigued. You start to feel tired of, of the daily routines and grinds of the ego, the repetition. I've got to do this and then I have to handle that, then I have to do this and handle that. And all those uh, meeting of needs and, and facing problems that seem to be on so many levels, whether they seem to be psychic or they seem to be interpersonal or individual within the body, or they seem to be global, whether they seem to be political, geopolitical, 
whatever they seem to be, intergalactic, maybe you like uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and you like to, to watch those intergalactic crises playing out, it, they're all really the same. Uh, uh, a little stab of pain, a little worldly pleasure, uh, a, an intergalactic battle, um, or a dog chasing a cat uh, around a house, they're all the same. They're all distractions away from knowing yourself as purely a, a holy child of God, forever in the mind of God. And many practices, we could say many spiritual practices involving meditation, attempt to just sit, whether it's sit in a particular way, a posture, breathing, all kinds of different things. There are many, many different techniques, but basically as long as it's the little I that you're identified with that's seen as the doer, the doer, the meditator, the breather, whatever, it's still going to seem to take a very, very, very long time to wake up from the dream. And I could say, you know, we're talking about into the mystic, Meditation is a very much a traditional practice of mystics, a very, very basic core fundamental technique that is involved in, in the mysticism, in the devotion to knowing yourself as one with God. And yet, in A Course in Miracles, in the I Need Do Nothing section of the text, Jesus talks about meditation and he talks about contemplation, he even talks about fighting against sin, he mentions these things, and basically he says they will all succeed because they're all means towards the end of, of knowing yourself as one with God, but he actually calls these things, again, meditation, contemplation, fighting against sin, he calls them tedious and time-consuming. That's what Jesus is talking about for traditional mysticism. Tedious and time-consuming. That will get your attention. And he says, your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you as a means of saving time. So we, we may get into the, the topic of holy relationship a bit in this Into the Mystic uh, retreat, because we know Jesus has a very different use for relationship than the ego. And then, of course, I would say still deeper than the holy relationship, which is really the means it, that the miracle uses, then you start to sink towards that stillness and that presence. And basically, that's really getting into the holy instant. That's getting in so deeply into the present moment where you let go of all thoughts of the future, all past regrets, all worries and of the future, anxieties, all, all love. Uh, lamenting the past, rehashing the past, going over the past, <laughs> digging through the past, past life regressions, all that will fade away in the holy instant. And so I think what I want to do as I, I talk to you today is say that this journey that I seem to have experienced in the parable of David, it's been so brand new at so many turns because it's not like I I had somebody initially that, that was a, a witness for it. There was no one that I, in my family or my circles when I was much younger that even slightly pointed in that direction. There, it was more reflections of, you need to work hard and make something of yourself in the world, carve out your niche, make a name for yourself, you need to strive. Uh, you need to achieve, then, then you, you can earn, and then you can save, and then you can accumulate, and then you can possess and own, and then eventually you may get a gold watch or something and a few blessings, and you can retire and uh, distract yourself uh, with television and uh, grandchildren and whatever you can come up with. Uh, but basically that was that's the ways of the world, and the world doesn't usually give us a lot of uh, signs and symbols. It's not really cheering us on to let go of everything. Uh, you know, people talk about the Bible, and and Jesus is a, is a great uh, demonstration and witness, and many people look to Jesus, but 
But Jesus basically was teaching, you know, my kingdom is not of this world and I'm calling you out of the world. In Course in Miracles terms, he's saying, I'm calling you into your mind so deeply into a shared purpose of forgiveness that you will have a happy dream where you will quit trying to egoically read meaning onto people and places and situations and you will experience a place of transcendence of uh, being above the battleground and just watching the world from that still point of non-judgment and that will be a very very happy dream and then God will take the final step and your dream will be gone. You will awaken from the dream. So that's a context that I've experienced that, that really is not part of the scripts of the world. You know, that's nothing that I was talked about at the dinner table when I was growing up. Okay, little David, how are you gonna, going to escape the dream world or uh, how are you going to play out your calling uh, to serve in the plan of, of the awakening from the dream and uh, take your part in, in the plan that is the, for everyone and for transcending this dream of time and space. There was no context like that. I was still within the bubble of the ego script. And so a lot of you, I feel, are at the point where you're starting to question the bubble of this ego script. And you're starting to feel like, I think I'm more than I appear to be. I may not fully know what that more is, but I'm more than a person, I'm more than a body, I'm more than a human being, and I'm actually undergoing an awakening experience. And even though it uh, can be a little scary at times and startling and, and uh, shocking, sometimes even a bit shocking, it still is calling to you so deeply that you find yourself ready to be shown, ready to let the Holy Spirit take the lead and willing to follow whatever those steps are. I know some of the questions that have been coming in too are about the helpfulness of, of having mighty companions. And as we look around, as I look at the screen and I see all your faces in all these different places, countries, situations, apartments, houses, all kinds of situations, I see reflections of, of, the, of the desire for mighty companions. You know, you all are mighty companions to one another because you're walking on this seeming journey without distance, but you're, you're walking together. And that's a beautiful thing. There's, there is a sense of, of um, camaraderie. There's a sense of fellowship. There's a sense of connectedness. There's a sense of, I am not alone on this journey that comes with the experience of mighty companions. And some people are experiencing it more digitally and others are saying, why can't I have a few, I would ha I'd be happy to have a few mighty companions where I live or even uh, maybe just one, one to show up, one mighty companion within the, so many uh, miles or kilometers of where I live, that would be helpful. Uh, and yet I'm sure if, if Jesus or Mary materialized at the foot of your bed, you, some of you would freak out. You'd be, holy Jesus, <laughs> I, I, I wanted a mighty companion, but that's a little sc scary, uh, this materialization stuff. But you won't be given anything as a symbol that would scare you. Uh, ultimately, you, you, we're asking for comfort. We're asking for blessing. We're asking for helpful instruction. We're asking for gentle reminders uh, along our days. That's really what the Mighty Companion is. And some of you have turned to A Course in Miracles. Some of you are going and just opening the Course. And, and that, for a time, has been your Mighty Companion, where you can, can just open the book up and receive what you need. Or you're watching the signs and symbols around you, the, on television or the billboards, the bumper stickers, the sights and sounds that you see. You're just so open to be shown to see the signs that help you keep moving inward. And so with the fears that come up, it, it is helpful also to have reminders of it's, it's, it's going to be okay to be held, to be hugged, to have someone 
giving you a smile, a gentle smile, when you seem to be going through intense fear or, or freaking out, you can start to see that there are times are those symbols of, of assurance are really helpful because they're just a reminder that nothing is really going wrong here, that, that you're just facing this unconscious darkness that's coming up and, and you have the Holy Spirit with you. So I thought today as we enter and deepen into the mystic, I would just start off by, by giving us a context here of and, and, and an opportunity to go into the experience of the presence. Because true spirituality does involve releasing the values of the world. It, if you wonder why is my spiritual journey seem at times to be slow, to, slow or tedious and time consuming or challenging or difficult, what's really going on is in the mind Egoically, if the mind chooses the ego, it means it values the ego's belief system. It means it values the death wish, and it values the, the value system of this death wish. The world was made as an attack on God. The world was made as a distraction device, so as long as you value the ego and its value system, its belief system, then you will still value the projected world that seems to be coming from the ego. And as you start to devalue the ego and put your faith and trust in the Holy Spirit, then you'll find that those blocks will start to dissolve and, and fade and actually disappear. And for those of you that have really taken on this course, I mean really sincerely and said, I will give myself over to this Course in Miracles. I will give myself over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And you really mean it, then you will notice that things will seem to fall away. In fact, uh, that we love it when you write in your questions, when you write in your prayers, when you write in what's on your heart, what's going on in your, your consciousness. I just wanted to, along the lines I was just speaking, I wanted to read something from Susan Gibson, who's in the United Kingdom. And Susan wrote, I am 73 years of age and have studied, practiced A Course in Miracles for the last 10 years. During the last five years, things, in quote, have just been dropping away as being not relative anymore. I am in the position now of there is the Lord Jesus and there is me. I am profoundly moved by the patience, wisdom, and beauty of the A Course in Miracles teachings and Jesus' everlasting willingness to be there for us. I feel deeply and signed up for Into the Mystic because David is someone I respect and mystic is a word I strongly relate to. So that's just beautiful. That's like Susan is just like saying, here I am, Lord. You know, that's like the prayer that Jesus gave through Helen Shuckman for Bill Thedford. Uh, it's a very short prayer, but here I am, Lord. It's in it, And the more you go into here I am, Lord, the more you are attentive to the stillness, the more that you release the values of this world, the so-called learnings and intelligence of this world, of linear time, the more that you release the pursuits and, and the desires for things of this world, then you sink into this, we'll call it like a mystic vibe. And, and Susan's saying, um, mystic is a word I strongly relate to. And so, that's what this is really about. And it does take trust. Uh, it, in other words, I have a lot of people I talk to and, and they say, oh, I trust, I trust. I'm not completely sure what I'm trusting in. Do I have to trust in people? Do I have to trust in, in religious scriptures? Do I have to trust in, uh, in anything of this world? And, and ultimately, 
uh, our trust has to be in God. Or if you feel the, the, the symbols of God, of, of Jesus, Holy Spirit, whatever those symbols of God and God's presence are for you, you're really trusting in a presence that's beyond the appearances and, and this invisible presence, invisible to the, to the eyes of the body, invisible in terms of perception, it's beyond perception. So p sometimes people say that's like a blind trust, but actually as you work with the Course in Miracles, that, that trust in the Holy Spirit is not going to feel blind to you at all. There will be so many reflections, like Kirsten was talking about with her trip to Japan. There will be so many reflections of that trust that it's going to feel very palpable to you. It's going to feel like it grows stronger and stronger and you will see that in the past you had just misplaced your faith and trust. You would just given it over to the ego and to the ego belief system. And as you trust in the Spirit, you find that ego belief system just fading, fading, fading away. So I thought what we would start off with today, all along the themes of trust, is I will just take us all through lesson number 47 from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. And so some of you who have your books, you may want to to pick them up if you'd like to read along. Sometimes it helps to not only hear the words, but actually to, to see the words, to perceive the words as well. And this is in line with what I was just speaking about. This is, is focusing your trust on God. Because that focus of your trust on God and the thought system that God is extending through the Holy Spirit and Jesus, that is where your strength will be found. That is where you'll find the strength, the safety, the tranquility, and everything that you need to guide you in unwinding from this linear world, in unwinding from the ego. You'll find it by your determination to sink inward and to really develop the trust and nurture that development, that trust in God. So this is Lesson 47. God is the strength in which I trust. If you are trusting in your own strength, you have every reason to be apprehensive, anxious, and fearful. What can you predict or control? What is there in you that can be counted on? What would give you the ability to be aware of all the facets of any problem and to resolve them in such a way that only good can come of it. What is there in you that gives you the recognition of the right solution and the guarantee that it will be accomplished? Of yourself, you can do none of these things. To believe that you can is to put your trust where trust is unwarranted and to justify fear, anxiety, depression, anger, and sorrow. Who can put his faith in weakness and feel safe? Yet who can put his faith in strength and feel weak? God is your safety in every circumstance. His voice speaks for him in all situations and in every aspect of all situations. Telling you exactly what to do to call upon his strength and his protection. I will emphasize that again. Telling you exactly what to do to call upon his strength and his protection. 
So when we talk about un undoing the doer, it's like don't immediately try to dismiss the doer. Oh, the body's not real, there is no bodies, there are no bodies, there's nothing outside me. You know, you, t you can't try to leapfrog into Divine Presence by dismissing and ignoring what you still believe in. And, and if you still believe in linear time, that means there still is a belief in the body as being more than a learning device. It's seen as an end. And then the ego will have you have the body doing all kinds of things just for the survival of that body, the fame of that body, the attention of that body. You know, it, it takes on this personality self, becomes an end, and the ego will use the world of images to support that end of staying misidentified with that body. But if you, again, he's telling you exactly what to do to call upon his strength and his protection. If you simply are going to listen and follow the instructions that the Holy Spirit gives for the use of the body and the use of time while you still believe in it, you are on the road to this Divine Presence. That's the, that's the direct shot, that's the fast track, is letting the Holy Spirit and Jesus guide you and use the body and all the images of the world for the awakening. There are no exceptions because God has no exceptions. And the voice which speaks for him thinks as he does. So again, the voice is just a symbol, but the voice that speaks for God thinks as God thinks. In other words, it's part of that thought system of pure divine love. Those are the thoughts that you want directing the body. I have talked to in other uh, online retreats about, you know, don't raise body thoughts to the level of mind. And sometimes people say, wow, I, it, that's in the Course? Does he actually say that? I, I must have blanked out on that one. What does that even mean? Don't raise body thoughts to the level of mind. Again, it's so fundamental. What he's teaching is, is don't give the body causation. The body should be under the direction of Christ, the Holy Spirit. The body should all through the day be under Christ's control. Let the Holy Spirit put the words in that come through the body. Let the actions, whatever those actions seem to be, come from the direction of the Holy Spirit and Christ. Let the body be a puppet to be used by the marionette. Uh, and basically the marionette is the spirit. Because as long as you believe that bodies are causative, then you believe that your actions can cause other things. You believe you can actually hurt another person with the body in thought or word or deed or action. You know, that's that's raising body thoughts to the level of mind. The body is just a learning device that, that can be used for a period of time by the Holy Spirit and then gently laid aside. That's all it's for. It really has no other purpose. Another way Jesus says it is the body is, is for the Holy Spirit to speak through. That's the purpose of the body, is to let the voice for God speak through it. And? No. There is no and. That's the end of the sentence. <laughs> the body is to let the Holy Spirit speak through it, you know, to let the voice for God speak through it. That's it. Is the body meant to be a lover? No. Is the body meant to be uh, famous? No. It, a learning device cannot really become famous. Uh, it can seem that way in the world. It seems that way, but actually the mind is, is where all that is real. And so when the mind is thinking it is famous through, through a body, it has gone way off into the ego. And so, and not only can it not become famous because mind is one and there's really nothing <laughs> to become famous with, with one mind, but also the, the, the mind cannot become infamous either. <laughs> so, 
It's only bodies, the projection of guilt onto bodies as evil tyrants and wicked people. That's just all a, a make-believe game. And actually, also, the flip side is true because if nothing is really happening in the arena of bodies, then that means that the mistakes that seem to occur are all just a misidentification of the mind. Let me say that again. The only seeming mistake you can ever make is the misidentification of the mind. Thinking that your mind is private and separate, split, separate from God. That's the mistake. And that one mistake has already been answered by the Holy Spirit. So whenever you are down and you feel so bad about what you've done in this world, and you've got a whole group of memories and collections of all the times you messed up, of all the times you were hurtful, of all the times you, you really made huge amounts of mistakes and errors, those are all body memories and the Holy Spirit is here to overlook all of those and to realize and show you that, that you are divine mind. You, you are still as God created you. You are still perfect. A, a holy, perfect child of God. So that's relieving too, isn't it? That, that all the mistakes you think you made weren't real mistakes <laughs> because it was the body that you projected all those mistakes to and God didn't create the body. The ego made it up to reinforce guilt. And this is so important because this is why I say don't raise body thoughts to the level of mind because when you do raise body thoughts to the level of mind, then you take personal responsibility for those body thoughts. And you say, oh, I was bad, I was wrong, I have committed evils and many, many sins. And that's all from that one mistake of raising body thoughts to the level of mind. That's the, that's the error right there. It's a misidentification. What's the solution? Jesus says, give them to me. Give them to me instead. Let me take charge of the puppet for a while. <laughs> you know, this, this puppet game, the puppet show has gone on and on and there's been so much guilt with the puppet show. And it's almost like Jesus is like, let me step back behind the puppet show. Would you mind giving me the crossbow and letting me move the marionettes for a while? That's all I want to do. Just give me a little time to, to, to do my puppet show of love and, and let me move the puppets so that they're, they're just extending love uh, like Mr. Rogers would do. You know, Mr. Rogers, he never planned to have a puppet show on his thing, but, but it was just one time there was a problem. The tapes, the, the, the film that they were using was disintegrating, so they had to come up with things to keep people's attention on, on television. And, and so basically he he put his hand through a, a wall and stuck a, a little puppet through it, and thus he was the voice of all the puppets. And of course, Mr. Rogers played out um, a lot of different puppets. Some of the puppets were quite uh, feisty, and you might say even some of his ego expressions got to come out uh, through the king and so on and so forth. But Jesus is, is saying, let me use the puppet to bring a blessing just for a while. Just give the puppet over to me for a while. Let all those body thoughts be under my control, under Christ's control, and then I will show you the unreality of those thoughts. And then the, those thoughts and the world of, of the ego will all fade in your awareness and disappear. So, we continue on. Wow, I've had so much fun here. I have to find out where, <laughs> where I was. Okay. Today we will try to reach past your own weakness to the source of real strength. Four five-minute practice periods are necessary today, and longer and more frequent ones are urged. Close your eyes and begin, as usual, by repeating the idea for the day. 
God is the strength in which I trust. Then spend a minute or two in searching for situations in your life which you have invested with fear. Dismissing each one by telling yourself, God is the strength in which I trust. You can see he's using a mind-searching technique of just letting those thoughts, any situation that's troubling you, it could be about a friend or a family member, it could be about a, a, a politician or a political situation, it can be about uh, believing you have your rights have been violated or believing that you are concerned about pollution, you know, world situations, world crisis, any situation that crosses your mind, you can dismiss it and tell yourself, God is the strength in which I trust. You see, it's, that's, that's how you build your trust in the Holy Spirit. That you can dismiss those thoughts and come back to the rock, the strong support in your mind, the presence of God. Now, try to slip past all concerns related to your own sense of inadequacy. It is obvious that any situation that causes you concern is associated with feelings of inadequacy. For otherwise, you would believe that you could deal with the situation successfully. So you can see where as long as there's this feeling of inadequacy, these kind of situation thoughts just flash through your mind like a Rolodex. They just roll through your mind throughout the day because they haven't reached a resolution. They're still, you're trying to, to personally handle these thoughts. What am I going to do about my partner? What am I going to do about my mother and my father? What am I going to do about my work situation or about this, this bodily symptom that has, a, has cropped up? What am I going to do about my next paycheck? What am I going to do about those bills that I have or the debt that I have? You know, you see, those are all just situations that are reflections of inadequacy because if you didn't believe you were inadequate, they wouldn't recur to you. You would have already said, oh, that's gone. I successfully solved that. Not just for once, but for forever. And those are the ones that are, that's, this is the mind training going on deep down inside. It is not by trusting yourself that you will gain confidence, but the strength of God in you is successful in all things. The recognition of your own frailty is a necessary step in the correction of your errors, but it is hardly a sufficient one in giving you the confidence in which you need and to which you are entitled. Now I'm going to go over the beginning of that sentence again because this is so important. Anyone who just is trying to affirm their way into God without first coming, like in 12 Steps, you watch the Jeffrey show, The Last Step, you have to come to an admission that you are powerless over trying to manage your addiction, manage your life as you know it. The recognition of your own frailty is a necessary step. Necessary. What is this saying? It's basically saying we do all these uh, expression sessions. This is, he's giving us the attitude that we need to go into the expression session with. We can't go in there in a state of complete denial where we aren't even open and willing to exposing the frailty. And that's what he's talking about. The recognition of your own frailty is a necessary step in the correction of your errors. Of course you're not going to build your confidence in the recognition of your own frailty. That's ridiculous to think that you'll be confident and frail. 
<laughs> you know, that's, it's not going to go there. But, but when he says it's a necessary step, he's just saying be humble, be transparent, be open. And that may be the greatest value that we all share in these online retreats, is that you can feel so much love and so much care and so much safety that when you have an opportunity to speak, you can say, you can express your miracles and your happiness and your joy, or you can say, things aren't going so well. Things are not going well. And uh, I have to say, I'm struggling with this, or I'm struggling with that. I, I have a ch real challenge in my life. And just by being able to speak up about what is difficult for you is exposing your frailty and recognizing you have frailty. But underneath it is the call for healing, and that will carry you. Most of us were not raised in cultures and families and situations where, you know, they, you sit down to have breakfast or lunch. Okay, what's going on with you? Uh, uh, tell us about it. Uh, where you can bear your soul, you can pour out your hurts, your pains, your struggles. You know, many of us were raised in families. If we started to go in that direction, it was zip it, just zip it. <laughs> or whether the words were even zip it, sometimes you get a look from mom or dad like that is not appropriate, that is not helpful, and you're messing up the family. You know, one of those, you're messing up the family looks, and and oh, you will be zipping it if you get a f enough of those, you're messing up the family looks. You will not feel a freedom of, of expression. And so this is why that line is really important. The recognition of your own frailty is a necessary step in the correction of your errors. This is what we love. Not only do we get beautiful prayers when you write in your, your questions, and, and you ex offer and express, we have some of the most beautiful prayers. Jean Martin, United Kingdom. This is what Jean wrote in. Beloved Father, please help me be to be aware of your beloved Son in everyone as you created us to be, spirit, whole, and innocent. Amen. Isn't that lovely? That's a prayer for all of us from Jean coming from the United Kingdom, that's lovely. And then there are others which actually are more saying, I, I have issues, I have struggles, I don't understand certain things, I, I, I'm curious, please address this online if possible. Um, and it's so beautiful because there's a transparency there that is healing just in offering it up like that. You might say publicly offering it up is a beautiful witness or demonstration of really you're talking to God and Holy Spirit, you're saying, here, I want this exposed because I want this healed. I want this to be gone from my awareness. I, I want to know you. I want to know your love and I want to let these blocks and these issues be given over. So as I was, I'll read that one more time because it's helpful for all of us. The recognition of your own frailty is a necessary step in the correction of your errors, but it is hardly a sufficient one in giving you the confidence which you need and to which you are entitled. So confidence is something that you need, good to know, and confidence is something that you are entitled to. You are entitled to be a vibrant, holy child of God, radiating love and joy and happiness. You are entitled to miracles. Is, I'm entitled to miracles. That's another workbook lesson. You're entitled to that, but you do have to go through this transparency phase of not hiding and protecting frailties, weaknesses, um, things that you feel have gone wrong. Don't hide them. Don't push them down and stuff them in the unconscious, but expose them with the intention to release them. You must gain, also gain an awareness that confidence in your real strength is fully justified in every respect and in all circumstances. In the latter phase of the practice period, try to reach down into 
your mind to a place of real safety. You will recognize that you have reached it if you have, if you feel a sense of deep peace, however briefly. And here's one of my favorite lines in the Course. Let go all the trivial things that churn and bubble on the surface of your mind and reach down and below them to the kingdom of heaven. There is a place in you where there is perfect peace. There is a place in you where nothing is impossible. There is a place in you where the strength of God abides. That's the remembrance that we need. We have to hold in mind that there is this place in mind, there is this state of mind that is heaven. And when you look at your day, that's why it's so important to to give the day over to God and make no decisions by yourself. Because of yourself you can accomplish nothing. That's why it's important to have faith that there will come a point in this spiritual journey for you where the silence and the stillness will call to you. And you have to be ready to follow when that comes, when the instructions come. I know I was in university for, for 10 years and questioning everything, pondering, what's it all about? Where's my life heading? What's the point of this? What's the point of all this learning? And then after I left the University of Cincinnati, then I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought, well, I'm not really feeling a worldly career. And I'm, at this point, I'm no longer interested in family, marriage, children, future. <laughs> I started to get this deep call come within and it, it you know it's like it was it was startling at that time and I remember uh then I started to get more specific instruction was that I was to uh get a little travel trailer and then somehow find a place for it which was turned out to be in the woods of Kentucky down near a tiny little town called Corinth Reminds me of Corinthians, you know, Jesus always throwing in lots of symbols. Corinth, <laughs> of all the things. I go, that's the chapter on love, some of you know the, from the Bible, the love chapter from Corinthians. And then I, I, my, my girlfriend at the time thought I was completely crazy. You're what? You're going to leave everything behind, including me, and <laughs> go to the woods? <laughs> You've lost your marbles? My mother... I, I, when I got this little travel trailer, I parked it at their house, my parents' house for a while, and she just was like, she thought it was just a used, tra tiny travel trailer. She thought it was probably an eyesore. <laughs> Get this thing out of my dr driveway. And probably was kind of a little relieved when <laughs> I finally had it hauled down to the, the country, into the woods. And that little hermitage down there on two-thirds of an acre at, near a lake, Lake Arrowhead, uh, near Corinth, Kentucky, that was a big step for me. Because why? Because people in our family, people for generations, don't just drop everything, university, pursuits, career, and everything, and go, what? Go to live in the woods. I mean, I don't think people in my family, I, I would try to say, oh, you know, like Henry David Thoreau. They're like, Henry who? You know, <laughs> we're not talking like, like, Ramana Maharshi kind of thing, where just even Henry David Thoreau, who? What are you doing? Are you throwing your life away? That hermitage experience was actually quite important for me. I took my Course in Miracle books down there in that little trailer, and I was experimenting like Henry David Thoreau, reading his On Walden Pond book and, and experimenting cooking different kinds of bread to try to find out what's the simplest bread that I can make, and the pancake one, in case some of you want to know, the pancake one. 
uh, <laughs> it beat all other forms of bread. So I'm like, all right, pancake. Okay, we're going to have pancakes and water. That's our diet. Well, the ego started screaming, you know, pancakes and water, that's it? Plain pancakes? What about the, the butter and the syrup? No, I'm living in the woods here. There's no, uh, there's no store nearby. So, you know, it's kind of reacted, the ego reacted, but it's going to react when you start following the voice for God. Of course it was upset with the diet of pancakes and water, but that's fine. It had to start somewhere. You know, you have to, you've got to take a stand. You're going for God, and then the ego is going to scream a bit. Of course, it doesn't want you to go to God, because if you go to God, then it's out of business. In fact, it, you see that it never was, and it doesn't want that. It wants to be something. It doesn't want to be nothing. <laughs> it's, it's trying to be something. With the power of your mind, it's like a parasite trying to be something. And your purpose is to join with the strength of God to go into your Christhood, your Christ idea and nature, and therefore return to be one with God in, in the Spirit, in, in the Kingdom of Heaven. You see, these, these two points of view don't really have a meeting point. One is saying you're holy, and the other is saying, you know, you're some kind of mistake, <laughs> and you need to somehow survive in your mistakeness. And those are very different points of view. So, as we get to that point, we have to let go of all the trivial things that churn and bubble on the surface of your mind and reach down and below them to the Kingdom of Heaven. And that's kind of giving us a sense of, of the movement that you have to allow for your mind. You have to allow it to go inward. You have to let go of, of trying to figure out and solve the puzzle of the world using the means of the world. In other words, the past. You know, if, if you say to yourself, uh, I don't have enough money, and I need money to survive, then the ego will say, good, let's get you a job, uh, or let's get you a career. If you don't want to just be making ends meet, you know, from moment to moment, you want something a little more, oh, let's have a job and a career and savings account and investments, and let's make a good nest egg so you can overcome your inadequacy. I'll tell you what, a nest egg doesn't overcome your belief in inadequacy. There's many people that I have known who had quite a large nest egg, and then when they were faced with what seemed to be cancer, or heart disease, or uh, some kind of a disaster in terms of the world, or some kind of major crisis that they perceived, they're just as frightened and anxious and concerned as anybody else, because money and possessions and trying to use devices of the world for health of the body, those are all in the wrong direction and they will crumble, they will pass away. And then the same fear and anxiety and worry comes, comes back and you just realize, oh my gosh, I just been, I've on a, been on a wild goose chase to search for safety, happiness and security in the world of images and oh my gosh, that's the wrong direction. That's the trick. I've been tricked by this trickster uh, in my mind. I've just made a mistake of identifying with the trickster, and all of that was for one purpose, to realize that I need to come back and let go of this, of this trickster. Now we're going to move directly into the experience. What, of, what is all that trust leading to? We're going to move into that directly. And we're going to jump to Lesson 109 now, I Rest in God. This is what all the trust was for. This is what all the preparation is for. This lesson is what all the unwinding was for. All the release of grievances was just to bring your mind into a willingness and a readiness for resting. And it, for many people, when they say, what is the meaning of life, they fill in the answer with many things. But usually most people don't fill in the meaning of life question with rest. 
and that's it. <laughs> that's the rest of the story, I'll tell you. Rest? That's the meaning of life? <laughs> rest? Think about it. If this is the meaning of life, don't you want reflections around you? Some of you do have that. Cats? Anybody? Who has cats? <laughs> The cats are pretty good with this message, like they're trying to give you the meaning of life. <laughs> and sometimes you resist, <laughs> but they're actually pretty good at this. Because the cats oftentimes will say, they'll give you a look, like, chill, man, rest, rest. Like you, You've got this whole thing backwards and upside down, rest. So this is from Jesus, and the lesson is, I rest in God. And, and the emphasis of that I is my mind rests in the mind of God. That's really the, the true meaning. It's not I as a person rest in God, because if you personally try to rest in God, it's going to be a contradiction of terms. And what you're going to find is, huh, I must be doing something wrong. I need a better meditation technique. Uh, maybe I'll get this in, in 200 years. Some of you know what I'm talking about, how when you try to rest your mind, the monkey mind is so uh, crazy that you wonder, how do people meditate? It's, it's because of this identification with the, the personal I. That I will never rest in God. That I will dissolve in God, but it won't rest in God. So we'll just keep that in mind as we read this beautiful lesson together. Just take a minute to just still your mind and be as open and as receptive as you can be. Take all of your mind, just tell it I am open to receive. I am open to the experience that this lesson offers. I rest in God. We ask for rest today and quietness unshaken by the world's appearances. We ask for peace and stillness in the midst of all the turmoil born of clashing dreams. We ask for safety and for happiness. Although we seem to look on danger and on sorrow, and we have the thought that will answer our asking with what we request. I rest in God. This thought will bring to you the rest and quiet, peace and stillness, and the safety and the happiness you seek. I rest in God. This thought has power to wake the sleeping truth in you, whose vision sees beyond appearances to that same truth in everyone and everything there is. Here is the end of suffering for all the world and everyone who ever came and yet will come to linger for a while. Here is the thought in which the Son of God is born again to recognize himself. I rest in God.
completely undismayed. This thought will carry you through storms and strife, past misery and pain, past loss and death, and onward to the certainty of God. There is no suffering it cannot heal. There is no problem that it cannot solve. And no appearance but will turn to truth before the eyes of you who rest in God. This is a day of peace. You rest in God. And while the world is torn by winds of hate, your rest remains completely undisturbed. Yours is the rest of truth. Appearances cannot intrude on you. You call to all to join you in your rest, and they will hear and come to you because you rest in God. They will not hear another voice than yours because you gave your voice to God and now you rest in Him and let Him speak through you. In Him you have no cares and no concerns, no burdens, no anxiety, no pain, no fear of future, and no past regrets. In timelessness you rest, while time goes by without its touch upon you. For your rest can never change in any way at all. You rest today, and as you close your eyes, Sink into stillness. Let these periods of rest and respite reassure your mind that all its frantic fantasies were but dreams of fever that has passed away. Let it be still and thankfully accept its healing. No more fearful dreams will come. Now that you rest, in God. Take time today to slip away from dreams and into peace. Each hour that you take your rest today, a tired mind is suddenly made glad. A bird with broken wings begins to sing. A stream long dry begins to flow again. The world is born again each time you rest and hourly remember that you came to bring the peace of God into the world, that it might take its rest along with you. You're starting to get the feel that, that rest is the meaning of life. Rest is the meaning of life. This, this exercise today, Jesus is not holding back on the value of rest, on the central purpose of rest. Rest is the plan of awakening. Rest is the final step. Rest is the final vision. Rest takes you where you have always been and always will be. And I know with all this programming and conditioning, the ego is having a fit with this lesson. Because it's like, yeah, incompetent, inadequate, lazy, bum. You know, it's going to have a fit with a direct lesson that tells you and leads you in the meaning of life. That your mind is entitled to rest. The ego will not be happy with this, but let's, let's continue. <laughs> with each five minutes that you rest today, the world is nearer waking. So, to give yourself over to this rest, with every five minutes, this 
brings the entire world nearer to waking. And the time when rest will be the only thing there is, what did he say? And the time when rest will be the only thing there is comes closer to all worn and tired minds, too weary now to go their way alone. And they will hear the bird begin to sing and see the stream begin to flow again with hope reborn and energy restored to walk with lightened steps along the road that suddenly seems as easy as they go. You rest within the peace of God today and call upon your brothers from your rest to draw them to their rest along with you. You're not just resting for your personal self, you're resting for everybody in the universe. Different planets that haven't even been discovered yet. Different, all the beings, you know, like we love the Spielberg and the, all the different sci-fi movies, you know, the Martians, the, the different beings on all the planets. Your rest is for all of them. Because why? Because you, and call upon your brothers from your rest to draw them to their rest along with you. Some of you remember I did that online retreat a little back on, on level confusion and, and, uh, and some of these online retreats. I actually mentioned the point that as long as you stay in hell, you keep your brothers and your sisters with you in hell. It's one mind and if you're in hell, then they're in hell. And if you wake up to heaven, guess what you've done? You've just saved the entire, not just the entire planet, but all the planets, all the beings, all the dimensions. You've just healed all the dimensions of time and space through what? Rest? My mind resting heals all the dimensions of time and space. My mind resting heals all people in the past who ever were sick and died and all people who will ever be born in the future. That's right. That's how big your rest is. Your rest is releasing the whole projection of time and space. Your rest heals history. That's right. History. History wouldn't even exist without the projection of the ego. It's just a repetition like Groundhog Day of the same mistake being repeated over and over. And what is it that's, that takes you out of the loop, that, that heals the whole universe? It's rest? You know, we're giving a good name to rest today. <laughs> Anybody who ever thought, well, maybe you thought of rest in terms of dualistic terms, like I'll, I'll be busy and I'll work hard and then I'll rest. You see how dualistic that is? You need a false sense of rest to heal the false sense of busyness and work, but we're not talking about that kind of resting the body. We're talking about resting your mind in the light of love, bathing in that light of love, sinking deep into that light of love, that divine light, and then all of the seeming rest of the world, all of the images, the fantasies, even history. And this is why we're so grateful for Jesus Christ, one who, a way shower who's gone beyond time and space, because when Jesus says, I rest in God, he's taking us deep. He's not telling us to sit in a lotus position for four or five hours. That's, that's small stuff. He's saying, rest with me and let's, let's dismiss all of history. Let's dismiss all of time and space. You're doing this for, you know, all those people in your life that you love that, that passed away, they're counting on your rest. Because, for what? What purpose? To show that those were just images and false memories. All those memories of loved ones of the past, that's all part of the distortion too. 
that your rest will actually free the whole universe. You know, there's one lesson where Jesus says, as you accept the gift of healing, legions upon legions will arise with you when you accept the gift of healing. Now, how could that even be? That seems enormous, that, that rest, that my mind resting would have that much of an impact. But you have to understand that all of the perceptual world was made to cover over your divine light and love. All of history was made to distract you from this rest. And what the mystics and saints have been talking about for, for centuries is like, this is gold. They've been offering us gems of gold to say, give your space, give this, your mind the space to rest. Give yourself the permission to let go of all those activities, your mind's attention on all those activities, and all those pursuits and desires, and just allow yourself to rest. Ultimately, for those of you that have been following me for years, I, I had a number of hermitage experiences where I would go off to the woods of Kentucky or the woods of Michigan. And, you know, a lot of you watch the YouTubes, but you don't really see what preceded the YouTubes was actually rest. I, in my late 20s, in my 30s, when I, the world would say, you better be out there hitting the pavement and getting the jobs and getting the careers and working on the relationships and building the family and and mowing the yard. I did quite a bit of mowing the yard, but uh, I still, you know, when I didn't have the house with the mortgage and the white picket fence, I was going down the street on my little uh, tractor mowing people's yards because that was my livelihood. That was my career. I was a lawnmower. I was a lawnmower man. Uh, but basically, I never really made myself much in the world. I'm so happy that I didn't really uh, go down too much pursuing of of the world because I probably wouldn't have been receptive <laughs> to these lessons if I had built up a, a major self-concept with m many multiple degrees and big six, seven figure salaries and all these things. Huh, arrest in God, cute. You know, I, if I was a, a famous person or a wealthy businessman, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm as God created me. Nice, sweet. And I'd be off to go back to the stock market or back to the races, the rat race. But no, I, I feel like that was my purpose, was uh, to start to be a nobody pretty early in my life. And this did not go over too well with my parents. You know, they were not, most parents' ambitions for their son is not to be a nobody. I'm nobody and nobody loves me. Well, Christ loves me, and Christ knows that I'm not a body. I am no body. And so you start to put it all together and realize, oh, all this pursuing to try to establish a career, an identity, a, 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 a whole pursuit, a future pursuit, is still part of the distraction away from what? Rest. I rest in God. You will be faithful to your trust today, forgetting no one, bringing everyone into the boundless circle of your peace, the holy sanctuary where you rest. Open the temple doors and let them come from far across the world and near as well. Your distant brothers and your closest friends Bid them all enter here and rest with you. So some of you have written in questions about what about where I live? People aren't into any of this stuff and I can't talk about A Course in Miracles. Ah, aha, here's the answer right here. It's in the rest. This is the meaning of life. As you rest, you call all of your brothers, distant and far from all around the world, you know, like that song that the OJs did. Anybody remember that love train? Tell all the folks from Russia and Egypt to Don't you miss this time? Don't you miss that train at the station? Cause if you miss it, I feel sorry, sorry for you. Whoa, whoa, 
whoa. And the whole song is about the love train from China. You know, it's a beautiful song. If you get, get your Apple Music out or your, your different apps and look that one up from the OJs, what you're doing when you rest, you're calling in all the people, friends, people you haven't even met, politicians, Donald Trump. That's right, you're bidding Donald Trump to come to you and rest with you. And you're bidding everyone to come into that rest because as your mind is healed, the whole universe is healed. It's just a perceptual problem. That's why I say with the Course in Miracles 12-step groups, you know, hi, my name is so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. You have to, this is part of realizing that you have a perceptual problem. That you have no other issues except a perceptual problem. You're seeing a world that doesn't exist. That's a hallucination. That's a perceptual problem. You know, when you come into the rest, you're releasing your hallucination issues. You're releasing your perceptual problem issues through the meaning of the world, which, which is the rest. Open the temple doors and let them come from far across the world and near as well, your distant brothers and your closest friends. Bid them all enter here and rest with you. And you might as well include all of the people from the past, you know, I've seen, like, out here in Utah, there's a lot on genealogy and family trees and family history. Go back generations. Invite your aunts and uncles, your parents, your grandparents, your great parents, especially, you know, even the ones that have seemingly dead and gone for, for centuries. Let's bring in Cleopatra. Let's take Julius Caesar with us. Let's take Hitler, Mussolini. Let's take Osama bin Laden. Oh, Sam, Saddam Hussein. Yes, we're taking Saddam on a trip with us today into the rest. Let's take all those saints too, the Yoganandas, you know, Gandhi. Let's go back to all the saints and mystics throughout time. St. Francis, let's take them all. All of them are projections. All of them were projections of the belief in separation. The saints and the sinners the evil masters and the, and the great masters are what? All the same because they're all projections of the belief in separation. And what's the one thing that's going to take you and heal the whole situation of time and space but this rest? Ah, come to the last paragraph. Ready to let go into this. You rest within the peace of God today, quiet and unafraid. Each brother comes to take his rest and offer it to you. We rest together here, for thus our rest is made complete. And what we give today, we have received already. Time is not the guardian of what we give today. So we're giving a gift that's actually timeless when we rest. We give to those unborn and those pass by, to every thought of God and to the mind in which these thoughts were born and where they rest. And that mind, I just read the word mind, is a capital mind. It's not talking about the split mind. It's talking about the mind of God and all the thoughts in the mind of God. And they're all spirit. They aren't bodies. You know, spirit is eternal. Bodies were actually never born. They just seem to be born and they seem to die. But we're giving over all of those so that we may behold these thoughts where they were born in spirit and where they rest. And we remind them of their resting place each time we tell ourselves, I rest in God. And so just like we need the trust in the strength that will take us inward through guidance to come to rest in God, then 
Of course, you, you can only imagine what the next lesson must be after I rest in God. What do you follow this up with? What would you possibly follow up I rest in God with? Well, I'll tell you what you follow it up with. I am as God created me. <laughs> That's the thought. Now we're really looking at what home means, is the, the correction of identity confusion and accepting yourself as the living Christ I am as God created me. That's, that's what all this resting is about. That's what the disappearance of the universe is about. It's all just a preliminary to I am as God created me. And I'll just give you a quick snippet of that because the ego doesn't like the rest in God lesson, but it, it's really afraid of the following lesson that follows it. And I'll just read briefly from that, and you'll understand why the ego is so afraid of the rest, because if the rest precedes I am as God created me, then the ego doesn't even want you to come close to resting. It just wants you to stay good and distracted, busy. It wants you to, to be caught up in the myriad sights and sounds and memories of, of time and space, because it's afraid of one thing. What is the ego most afraid of? The recognition, I am as God created me. We will repeat today's idea from time to time. For this one thought would be enough to save you and the world if you believed that it is true. Its truth would mean that you have made no changes in yourself that have reality, nor changed the universe, so that what God created was replaced by fear and evil, misery and death. If you remain as God created you, your fear has no meaning. Evil is not real and misery and death do not exist. Today's idea, which is I am as God created me, is therefore all you need to let complete correction heal your mind and give you perfect vision that will heal all the mistakes that any mind has made at any time or place. It is enough to heal the past and make the future free. It is enough to let the present be accepted as it is. It is enough to let time be the means for all the world to learn escape from time and every change that time appears to bring in passing by. If you remain as God created you, appearances cannot replace the truth, health cannot turn into sickness, nor can death be substitute for life or fear for love. All this has not occurred if you remain as God created you. You need no thought but just this one to let redemption come to light the world and free it from the past. So now we're down to the core. This, this gives you actually a perfect framework for into the mystic. In other words, you, you have to trust and follow what the voice for God is going to instruct you to do to unwind from the world. You do need that trust because if you really want to hear guidance, you have to want the guidance. If you're too afraid of the guidance or where the guidance is, is directing your mind and where it's leading you, then you won't want to hear the guidance, right? If, if, if the guidance is to have you leave the ego behind and the ego doesn't want to be left behind <laughs> and you side more with the ego, then you're not going to want to hear the Holy Spirit. You're going to want to listen and serve and follow the ego instead because the ego doesn't want you to escape from this linear preference package perception of a world where it's just, oh, which, what do I prefer today? Well, am I going to have the chocolate, the mocha coffee, or French vanilla, or English toffee, or maybe just a glass of water? You know, it's, it, the ego is just every day, what seems to be life on earth is just picking from the preference package of the ego. It invented all of these options so that you'd get so distracted and you would freeze, you'd have brain freeze. 
you would just, you'd go, oh my gosh, I am not just a lowly worm. I am a, a proud human being and I have some degrees. I have a good job. I've got a car. I've got a wallet, a purse. I've got a house. I've got investments. I am, I have handled the world of scarcity and I got the world on a string sitting on a rainbow. Got the string around my finger. What a world. What a life. I'm in love. No, you're not. You have just swallowed the biggest lie. <laughs> you're not in love. And you're not sitting on top of the world looking down on creation like the carpenters talked about. You've just bought the biggest lie that there ever is that you can make yourself apart from God as God created you. God created you as spirit and if you're believing all those things and you think you're, you're kind of cruising on top of the world and you think you've got it better than all those other ones that, that haven't made it, no, it's deception. This is all part of a grand scheme of deception. And what you need is to listen to the to Holy Spirit to unwind from this whole crazy belief system of past and future. Then, this is going to be the big one, is when you actually start allowing yourself that rest that, that we read about. When you actually start to realize that your prayers and your meditations start to take up more and more and more of your day. That actually you're drawn not to rush home and turn on the television. You're drawn not to rush to this place or that place so you can perceive with your body's eyes and hear with your body's ears some kind of new, stimulating, exciting adventure. You've got the hot ticket to the hot concert. You've got the, the chance of a lifetime to go on the voyage of your lifetime, the world would say, and have a feast for your five senses. No, no, that's... Remember, the meaning of life is rest. It doesn't really matter what the perception is. If you can just allow yourself to rest and give yourself that allowance, I will guarantee that that will begin to take over your consciousness. The rest will start to permeate your consciousness. It will envelop your consciousness. Imagine that. Instead of having future goals for career and family and all these kind of distractions of the world, that imagine if you were like five years old and, and somebody said to you, okay, in the middle of your cereal, what do you think, little Susie? What, what do you want out of life? I want to rest so deeply that the rest engulfs my entire consciousness. <laughs> okay, Susie, that's good. Finish your Wheaties. Uh, you know, that, you know, Susie probably would have maybe had to leave the table, the <laughs> breakfast table. Because to the ego, that would have been blasphemy. That's blasphemy. What? My, my rest will be, will engulf my entire consciousness and, and, and literally dissolve the entire projected world and all of time and history. Can you imagine such a state of mind? That's like an avatar for sure. Susie's... <laughs> Susie said five, she's an avatar. If she's saying she's going to dissolve all of time and space with rest. But I'm just saying that as an example to show you how it contradicts all of our programming and conditioning that all of us have been driven by as human beings. Where do you think all the stress came from? Trying to live up to an unnatural identity that is not real and not true. And we've tried to measure up to whatever, call it a successful citizen, call it a full functioning human citizen in planet Earth, call it whatever you want. It's all been part of a self-concept that was made to take the place of the truth of our being, which is pure spirit. So I'm getting excited. I mean, this is to me, this is the excitement of rest. <laughs> Some people say rest is boring. It's not boring to me. I've, I'm, I'm lit up like in full gratitude and full vitality. I am overflowing with energy. I'm not fatigued. I'm not tired. I'm not feeling old. I'm not feeling worn out. 
I'm feeling very restful, actually. And the Spirit is, actually, we read that in the lesson that the Spirit is using these lips right now. <laughs> and, and the exercise of letting the Spirit speak through me is energizing. It's not uh, fatiguing at all. And I'm happy we've been able to actually have this experience together because what it does is it just it, it gives you a new whole perspective on things. So that when someone comes to you and say, what have you done for me lately? Uh, whether it's a parent, a boss, a partner, whatever, like, come on, uh, what have you done for me lately? You know, remember that Arsenio Hall had a show years ago, remember, anybody remember Arsenio Hall? How would he end his monologue? It's time to get busy. No, the meaning of life, Arsenio. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of life for all of us, that Jesus is telling me, remember the meaning of life is, is rest. And, and whenever you feel fatigued, it just means that you've been giving your mind's energy over to these egoic thoughts. You're on the hamster wheel, the monkey mind of got to produce, got to put out, got to achieve. I have to make something of myself. I have to prove my worth. I have to show the world how, I, how good I can be. I have to make it to the top. This just goes on and on and on. Those thoughts are fatiguing. Those thoughts are stressful. Whether you even seem to achieve those thoughts or you don't, it's the same. If you succeed in those things, it's a lie. If you fail at those things, it's a lie. <laughs> You've never done anything good ever, because why? You've never done anything bad ever, because your body, Jesus says, is a learning device. How many of you have a, like an iPhone and that you wake up, you turn it on in the morning and you go, good iPhone, good iPhone. Oh, you're so good to me. You work oh, most of the time. You're pretty consistent. You're a good iPhone. Or how many people curse their iPhone? They wake up in the morning, you damn iPhone. I got, how long have I got to put up with you? You know, you keep holding me back every day. I could, I could achieve so many things. But no, nope, we don't say that to iPhones because why? Because an iPhone is just a learning device. It's just a supercomputer that's in a small little package that has a great microprocessor, if you have a smartphone, you know, and that is capable of doing all these things. But you don't yell at, at the learning device, neither do you heap praise on the learning device every day. The body is similar to the iPhone. It's just a, a learning device. It's a communication device. It doesn't really have anything to do with your spirit. The body really doesn't have anything to do with your divine mind or your Christ Self. It's just a learning device. But why would you blame a learning device for the upset that you feel in your mind? When the learning device is beyond, it's just neutral, it, it's beyond praise and it's beyond criticism. It's just a learning device. It's nothing more than a learning device. And so that's what I'm saying. When you, when you look at your partner, you have to learn to trust the Christ in them. You have to learn to see beyond the body. You have to learn to have faith and trust in who they really are, not in their, their flesh suit. You know, that's not who they are. That's not who God created. You, you want to learn to, to become in touch with the spirit that they are. Why? Because that's the spirit that you are too. You, you, we share the same spirit. There's just one of us in spirit. And similarly, that's why all the issues of guilt come from putting faith into the perceptual world, even in the body. Oh, this is, this is such a beautiful body. Oh, I like this. It's such a healthy body. You know, we, we don't often talk about it. And then now they're starting to do that with iPhones. They dress them up and they've got little clothes for the iPhones, don't you know? You see the cute little things? Oh, it's this and this. And now not only are they beautiful, uh, put beautiful clothes on the iPhones, but they put battery packs into them so you can't run out of, you know, 
It's like it's the same thing that we do with the human bodies. We dress them up, we make up, we put all these things on them, we adorn them with things to try to make them better. It's just a learning device. It's a communication device. You know, nobody, used to, the old days used to do this with the pencils. I mean, there were some pencils that got dressed up too, but that's just the ego trying to make something more of something than it actually is. Because the ego says, no, the body is your home. You've lost God, you've lost heaven, and now you better make the best of it and adorn this make-believe thing with as many fantasies as you can to try to make the best of a really bad situation, the ego says. What is that really bad situation? The fall from grace. <laughs> what is that bad situation? It has a word for it, sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't even know of sin. The Holy Spirit just sees errors to be corrected, really just one identity error to be corrected. And then the ego makes this big thing called sin, and it's so heavy. And it's like the, the ego uses the concept of sin to perpetuate guilt, and it's not seeing that sin is easily corrected and already has been corrected. It's saying, no, you will, you will never be able. It's a black mark on your soul. You're, you're damned. You're, you know, you're, 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 you're cast out of heaven for all of eternity because of what you've done. Now, come over here and make the best of it, you know. Come and follow me over here, make the best of a bad situation. This is where all the dreams and fantasies distractions of the world is by listening to that tempting idea, let's make the best of a bad situation. And the Holy Spirit is like, why not learn to forgive a situation that actually never happened? You see, there's a different, <laughs> there's a different view there. Let's, let's learn to overlook what never happened. And the ego is saying, let's make the best of a very bad situation. See, those are the perspectives. That's, you've got a choice. You're going to have to follow one or the other. So I always like to keep these as practical as possible. And even though we've just enjoyed that beautiful rest exercise, I know there's about 125, 130 of you out there today. And we have these very practical prayers and things that you've sent in. And now that we have a context for everything, Hopefully, a lot of these have already been answered. Just, just by resting together, I would venture to say that we've just handled a lot of this. You see, that's why rest is the meaning of life, because just by resting together, we have just solved so many questions and so many problems. And as much as I would love to, to delve into these these kind of uh, things, which probably many are gone, why don't we just go live <laughs> to you and, and have you uh, raise your hand, either your physical hand or your digital hand. Some of you know how to use uh, Zoom in that way. And uh, after all that, that beautiful rest that we've all just gone through, uh, there we, I see some hands going up. Let's uh, have Jeff took a look at the big board and uh, and let some of you come on live now, because that's what this is really about. It's coming into the joy and the aliveness that comes from this beautiful rest. <laughs> look at that! Look at that group in Florida! My <laughs> gosh, those those three. <laughs> I see a lot of fingers, <laughs> arms and fingers going there. Is that Kyle? Yeah. Kyle? Okay. You looked like one of the first hands up and then all the fingers were, were coming up. Let's, let's go into this. This is so beautiful to see you all there from Florida. All right. Cool. Yeah, if, if I wasn't the first hand up, we were the most enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, I saw. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is so beautiful. I actually, this morning, I had this question of, from this whole perspective uh, that we're talking about, Course Miracles and, and mysticism, uh, what's, what's the definition of sin? Sin is 
an error to be corrected. I would say also that sin is an error that has already been corrected. So when, when people say about the Course, oh, the Course is crazy New Age philosophy because it says that sin doesn't even exist. Um, when people say that, I have a lot of uh, Christian people, Christians will look and they'll try to summarize the Course and they'll say, well, one reason that you know that it's the work of the devil is because it says that sin isn't real. But actually, if you actually read the Course, Jesus and the Holy Spirit use the Word basically through, throughout the Course. Even we'll talk about uh, one section basically says you still find sin attractive. But you're asking a beautiful question like, what is the definition of sin? And sin is the error of believing that you can be something different than God created you to be. It's just an error. In other words, it's not a black mark on your soul that you are forever cast out of heaven, that you forever, you did something so insulting to God that, that somehow you were cast out of heaven because you did something that was so bad. But actually, uh, a lot of people know in the Bible, it talks about the, the the Garden of Eden, it talks about Adam and Eve, it talks about the serpent. Some of you who were raised in Christianity, you, you remember all those ideas. And then um, there's the apple, don't, don't eat from the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then uh, the apple, and then taking a bite out of that, that's, that's symbolic of you're disobeying God. God said, don't eat from the fruit of this tree of good and evil. Really, the symbology is good and evil is duality. Don't take a bite out of the fruit of duality because you are single. You are the Christ. You are one with God and you will never understand duality. If you take a bite out of, of duality, you're, you're going to forget who you are. You're going to have a big amnesia. But the best part is, is in The Course in Miracles, Jesus says, God would never put you in such a position. You see how we're taking an anthropomorphic, kind of a human like God that says, almost like a parent saying, oh, here's a candy jar. Now, little Susie, whatever you do, don't eat. I'm going to go away, but just don't eat out of this candy jar and leaving a candy jar there with a little child. And that's kind of the same as, as if it's the Garden of Eden and there's Adam and Eve and then the tree and then God saying, Whatever you do, don't eat the fruit of that. What I love about The Course in Miracles is Jesus says, God would never put you in such a position. And that, for that reason, there is no sin in heaven, and there is no sin in spirit, and there is no sin in reality. But if you believe in the separation from God, if you believe in the ego, that ego is the belief that you can be something that you are not. You can take on a form. You can, you can die. You can be born. You know. You can, you can do. You can be stuck believing you're the doer and being guilty and stressed out about that crazy belief. But that's all part of we could say sin, which is really just error. And the Holy Spirit is the correction, and the atonement principle is, is, is the correction. That what is the atonement? It's the awareness that the separation never happened. It doesn't try to correct a real error <laughs> that God doesn't even know about. You know, God is so pure and so pure love that God doesn't even know of error. But the Holy Spirit and the Atonement Principle is simply the awareness that the separation never happened. And sometimes people will ask me, you know, what are you so happy about? I mean, there was one guy who came here recently to the, at the monastery uh, this summer. Uh, some of you, probably Melissa remembers, and Kyle Clint. Remember Clint? Clint was there, and Clint said, I don't know, Jesus, he, David keeps talking about Jesus, and he seems to be so in love with Jesus. He just can't shut up about, I, I really want to know what that experience David's having with Jesus. And it was simply, again, following these teachings and coming deeper and deeper into that experience that that. The separation didn't happen. 
which is another way of saying you don't ever have to blame anybody, you never have to make anybody guilty, you never have to give them the what for, well, you did this and you didn't do this, because you come into a state of such joy and happiness and fulfillment in, within your own being as the Christ that you don't blame anything or anyone on the world anymore. Neither do you need the images of the world to be happy. You're happy because of your source. You're happy because of who created you. And so that is, the, in a nutshell, what sin is. Sin is just an error that has already been corrected. Now, also I should say that Jesus says, he says, you're responsible for accepting the correction. Not, you're not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction. And he also says, but he says, but don't project this error to time. Whenever we blame time itself, or we blame the weather, or we blame a politician, we blame a partner, we blame a body that we mistakenly thought was ourself, like, oh, I always do this, I always make the same mistake, meaning the body, then you're projecting that error to time and space. And Jesus is saying, no, you'll, you won't be able to accept the correction if you keep projecting and blaming the world. And that's why Jesus says, seek not to change the world. Instead, ex change your mind about the world. He's just saying, forgive. Just forgive and, and you'll be set free. So I hope that answers your question, because the, with a lot of uh, Christians, they, they will project that onto the Course and say, Oh, it's, it's got to be a crazy New Age teaching because it's teaching that there is no sin. Well, if they would go open the book, they'd find that sin is mentioned like a lot of words throughout the book, but it's in a whole different context than saying that sin is a reality and that Jesus had to suffer and die as a sacrificial lamb for the real sin. They have just misinterpreted what, what the whole crucifixion and resurrection was really about, was just stay with me, stay in alignment with the Holy Spirit and me, and you will, you'll be happy because you'll be remembering who you are as a perfect child of God, not focusing on sacrifice, penance, punishment. You know, these are all, the ego made up a whole religion to twist the message of Jesus and turn the whole message of Jesus upside down and it's all about sin and fear and guilt. Uh, even, I mean, I've had some Christians sometimes who will say to me, don't you know what the Bible says? Fear God and keep His commandments. And I'll say, yeah, all that means is be in awe of God because God is the Creator and keep His commandments. Stay with the, the laws of God. That's all that it means. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be trembling and afraid of what? If God is love, why are, why are you so afraid of God? You know, what's the point of it all? You start to see that the ego just invented a whole different uh, religion and a whole different theology based on the ego's purposes so that you would forever be guilty and forever believe that sin is real. They will even say, say the sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer. Now, now you've got a thing called sinner. It's not just sin as if it's just um, a mistake, but now it's projected onto what? People. And then you start to, oh, people are sinners. No, they're learn bodies are learning devices. They aren't, bodies aren't sinners. Bodies, learning devices. I, that's like saying that whole generation of iPhone 7s, they're all sinners. You know, people would say, you are lost your marbles if you think all iPhone 7s are sinners. Because they're just learning devices, you know. You, why would you pin error onto a learning device? And that's what happens when, when you project it onto. You know, we're, we're probably, I'm speaking probably of things that are probably won't be known on earth probably for many centuries, but we're doing our best <laughs> with videos and the course and putting this out on speakers and whatever. But probably it's going to be probably a couple centuries before people go, whoa, that's profound. Because there has to be a readiness. That's, what, that's why we're all here right now, is because we're ready for this glorious, happy, innocent experience. Uh, that's, what we, that's why you're all so enthusiastic with arms up and fingers pointing. And, so 
So thank you, our beloved ones in Florida, for that first question. What is the definition of sin? Wow, that was a good zinger. We've got three minutes, they're telling me, but we might even be able to, we can, what do we got? We got somebody else in the field here? We sure do. Sabina, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have um, so um, I wanted to say that when, when we started this session, um, I was in a very bad mood or shape. I, 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 I felt like crying the whole time and tears were flowing and I had health issues and this, this was the same thing happened yesterday. But while you were talking, Ada, I mean, it must have been in these lessons which were very, very powerful. For example, the first one about trust. Trust is one of my main issues since this, since the festival, since Yuta. And my trust has been strengthened, but still not enough. It's still in the process of being strengthened. And then it's about resting in God, because this is one of my main issues, being having a, a restful mind and um, staying in this in this mind because. I always tended to be very active and running around the whole time. But I want to talk about the result of all this reading and listening and yeah, and perhaps reflecting on this subconsciously. But I feel much calmer now. I don't want to say um, that everything has gone. There is still sadness in me, but this would be too much of a good thing. But Anyway, I feel much better, and so something must have happened, and so I think I don't have to name it specifically what happened. Just happened something, so something must have happened, and this is a, is a being greater than me who did this, who created this. It was not myself, I don't know who did it. Certainly Christ, certainly Jesus, certainly the Holy Spirit a higher being, but I'm so grateful and I want to stay on this track and I think these three lessons will be very, very helpful and I will go through them a lot of times in the next day. Oh. So thank you very much. I want oh. to say this. Thank you. Um, thank you. What a beautiful witness. Oh, all, all of you are, this just Sabine, that's so dear. It touches my heart. So it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with all of us because that's the power of this, the, the healing power of us joining together like this, and you've just witnessed to that. Well, I'm getting the, the message that we've reached the, the top of the hour as far as uh, wrapping this session up, but this afternoon I can just say that, uh, as I said, we're, this will be different from a lot of our online retreats. Um, I believe we're going to have some uh, beautiful clips coming in, um, some beautiful Hollywood clips uh, from movies that will assist us in being carried through the through the visual, through the music, uh, through what is spoken, and uh, and also I think the final vision is is standing by for perhaps a little mini uh, concert. Uh, so you know here we have words in the morning and some silence and stillness, and then we're going to go into clips and and beautiful music from the final vision. So that's what's coming up this afternoon. I believe it's a three hour session too. So it'll be beautiful there. And I think uh, we always like the interactivity. So if you have um, things that you'd like to share and everything, be ready to, to chime in with everybody else. So I see all your beautiful faces and it's been an honor to be with you and uh, Thank you so much for being with me and sharing this experience with me. And I feel our minds are connected in a very deep way. And there's so much joy. It's like a, a, a fountain of joy that wants to come up and wants to burst through and, and burst all over the world. And we're just part of the, the first generation of this experience of letting that love burst out on the world. Because... Jesus did say that the world has not undergone a comprehensive awakening at this point. But what I'm hearing from Jesus is we're, we're part of the comprehensive awakening. We're, we're part of having such a shared experience of such unconditional love come bursting forth 
throughout the world that it will be so recognized because everybody wants it underneath underneath the mask of the personality everybody is crying out for this love and now we're opening we're clearing our minds so we can be the bringers let we can bring that peace and that happiness and love so thank you all good afternoon good evening and good night from wherever you are and this next session is coming up <laughs>